something Madhouse on iHeartRadio. And welcome to Motorcycle Madhouse. We got a real big special today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Freddie Angelo. He is the former national president of the Pagans Motorcycle Club. And as everyone knows, uh, he's been involved in a case. He was actually uh, sentenced, uh, found guilty of the murder of April Kaufman. This was a really big case. And there's been somebody behind the scenes releasing a lot of the good information that the news media hasn't been uh, picking up. And she has been working for Freddie for over a year and a half, I believe. And we're going to get into the uh, nuts and bolts of this case. And we're going to see if we can uh, help Freddie out. If you guys would like to uh, drop uh, Freddie a letter for uh, some support or give him some commissary funds or whatever you may want to do patty will uh give you that information during the show so get your pens ready if you're listening over on spotify and itunes this will be a two-part series uh it's gonna be a good one again we're gonna get into nuts and bolts how you doing patty I'm doing good, Hollywood. How are you today? I am doing great. Doing great. It's great to hear from you. Uh, I know I've been in the background with you for the uh, last couple of months, and you've been uh, you know, going over the case with me and stuff, but uh, do you want to tell the audience, uh, since you are involved in the case in the background, what it was all about and what's currently going on with Freddie? Sure. Um, and thank you again for having me, considering the local media and news channels in South Jersey and the Philadelphia area, um, I guess are as corrupt as Fox News and others nationally. Um, I really appreciate this, and I know that Freddie does as well. Mm -hmm. um, and well I to you, you guys are going to be worldwide, so you don't have to even be uh, locally anymore. We're going for the big bang here. I appreciate it. And before we start, um, I just want to make just a, a general statement to the world that, number one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for a lot of things. I'm sorry that this interview is probably going to change a lot of people's lives, and I never set out to hurt anybody. This is about making things right for April Kaufman and for Freddie Ogello. This isn't about me. Um, whew. And take, take anything I say should not be considered a threat to myself or others and people understand why I'm saying that later on in the show. And even though you can't see it, I'm going to put my hand on the Bible real quick, and I'm going to tell everybody that what I'm about to say is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help me God. That said, um, I don't even know where to begin. This is just such a mess. Well, let's let's be let's begin about uh, what this case was about, what he was charged for. You know, let's get into uh, you know for people who don't know the case. Okay, April Kaufman was murdered um, in May of two thousand and twelve, and the case didn't go anywhere for years. Um. 2017, Damon Tyner became the Atlanta County prosecutor, and he set out to make a name for himself. He had run for political office before in the past, and he actually was appointed a Superior Court judge and went backwards, which um, I think is probably the only time you'll hear about that in U.S. history. He went backwards from being a judge to a prosecutor because the prosecutor is a mouthpiece. In, in some aspects, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. He gets to go around, schmooze, talk, and that enabled him to do things he couldn't do while sitting on a bench. And he wanted to be famous and move on to in, you know, other political endeavors. However, they made up a story that involved the pagans and other things and framed Freddie O'Gallo for April Kaufman's murder. I unfortunately know the truth, and I felt guilty myself for years that I had something to do with April's murder. 
because really she was murdered because we were exposing Jim Kaufman for not really being a veteran. It had nothing to do with drugs. It had nothing to do with motorcycles. Nothing, 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 nothing. This was all a, a big lie. And the F, Dan Garibrand at the FBI and Jim Scopa at the prosecutor's office, them, they, they tried to make a big RICO act um, mm. matter. To, you know, like I said, this is all for people to become famous. Well, newsflash, they're getting their wish. They're going to be famous, but it's going to be for all the wrong reasons now. And they're going to be used as examples on what not to do. Mm-hmm. Now, did you have contact with April? Yes. Okay. I had a lot of contact with April. April and I go back to, like, 1980. Wow. Okay. Um, even though we didn't attend the same high school, we are perhaps crossed numerous times. My friends lived in different areas in South Jersey. I had grown up in New Gretna. And the beginning of freshman year, my mom and I fled to Chelsea Heights in Atlantic City um, to get away from my dad. And so my friends are all over the place. Um, now, I, now, was my, it, was I, April in, uh, was she a radio uh, host or a DJ or something like that? Yes, she was, uh, she did a lot of things. She was a, a jack of all trades. She was a wonderful woman. She did a lot to try to help veterans in this area. Um, some listeners might have even um come across her out at the Corbett Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, because she also did organize things there about vets for vets. Mm-hmm. Um, like she was doing as much as she could. She had gotten her husband and TRICARE, TRICARE involved with Jim's medical practice and was doing as much as she could for veterans in South Jersey. Um, as, like that, that was one of her, her causes in mm-hmm. life. Right. Now, what what, what uh, station did she work at? Oh, God. I don't have any notes with me. It was in Ocean City, and I, I can get that um, right. for you. I don't well, I'm, I'm, right I'm, now. I'm right. just wondering if uh, her, co- her company or uh, the former employer is actually involved in getting the truth out. I would think that uh, she was on the King Richard show, so I'm sure if somebody Googled that, um, the, the, the gentleman that she, like, worked with, um, I'm sure a lot of people want the truth. And actually, a lot of people know the truth and are afraid to come out and say it. Mm-hmm. And I don't blame them. Because, look, God forbid anybody goes through what I've been through in the last year and a half. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Right. There are people that know the truth. And, yes, when all is said and done and... and um, this isn't over yet. Like this is far from being over. Um, if if my action for everything, you know, doesn't settle outside of court, I'll put a whole shitload of people on a witness stand that'll mm-hmm. have to tell the truth. Right. That's the way it is. When, when did uh, when did Freddie's conviction come down? They arrested him um, January 9th. April 3rd on his birthday is when the indictment came down. His trial was in September and finished, I think, October 2nd or 3rd. And he was sentenced on December 5th, I believe. Mm -hmm. And what was his sentence? Just so we can give a background. He got sentenced for, he, he, he got blamed for arranging the murder and, oh, my God, there's a list of things he was charged with, um, even for putting out a hit on Jim Kaufman in the jail, which I told the FBI the day before they supposedly found him dead, that there was no hit out on Jim by the Pagans or the Mafia. And the reason I was confident in saying that is because I have friends in both organizations, so I knew what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Andrew Glick admitted on the stand that there was never a hit out on Jim. Right, and uh, you know the, you're, the Jim you're talking about is the uh, the guy James committed. Kaufman, the doctor that actually murdered his wife himself. Yeah, the co- the coward that ki- uh, committed suicide. Did he? Yeah, no, that's uh, the thing that we need to talk about. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have lots to talk about. <laughs> right yeah. now, now to go through the timeline, uh, April, uh, how was uh, she killed? She was she was shot. She was shot. Okay. Yes, uh, in her bedroom. 
Now, what led the, you know, the four, I call them forever bother Italians, FBI. Uh, <laughs> Fucking blooming idiots is what I call them. <laughs> right. Uh, what led them on this search into the pagans? Well, they knew that Jim was involved with other corrupt activities involving things that are doctor related, I guess you would say, uh, pain medication creams. Um, and other things like that. So ba they basic, were investigating. Basic. That's why they originally picked him up was for like corruption and fraud, like doing things in the medical field. Basically, it had nothing to do with April's murder. Basically, he was drug dealing, you know, through prescriptions. Not just that, he was doing bigger things like how Joey Merlino got arrested for the same thing. Mm. Um, there's a bunch of people that were doing things, and, and I don't know how. I forget we're talking to people in the world, and people don't know what I'm talking about, so I apologize, people. There was a lot going on in South Jersey that was in the U.S. District Court in Camden about fraud concerning the health plan, Blue Cross and Blue Shield health plan out of New Jersey. A lot of people were getting the medicines and things of that nature that didn't need it and making millions of dollars, so there's a whole big pharmaceutical issue that he was involved in. Of course, you never heard any more about that either. Mm -hmm. Well, insurance fraud, basically. Yeah, that, and yeah, that, that, that sums it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what was his connection to the pagans? How did, uh, you know, the FBI draw this connection, supposed connection? A couple individuals that were in the motorcycle club were patients of his. Um, Glenn Sealer was one. Joseph Mahal, and even though he's not technically a pagan, he's in the minor league club, the herd. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Glick, hello. Yeah, that's a whole day right there. Andrew um, Andrew was the rat, right? Yeah, the chef rat. Yeah, he was lying a rat. rat. It's a lying rat. It's not even a rat rat because he wasn't telling the truth. So I don't know what title you'd give him, right. but yes. Okay. They were patients, and they were seeing him after hours and different things. Like, so, you know, they had uh, charts there, but they were, even if if you had the medical records, you'll see Freddie's not on any, but as the, you know when you go in the doctor's office and you fill out, like, your first time you're there, right. and you say, did somebody refer you? Glenn Sealer's the name, not Freddie. Mm -hmm. Um. So they had those guys, and everybody would love. Everybody loves to screw with people in motorcycle clubs. That's just the way our country is. I guess I don't know why. I I personally don't judge anyone. I there's there's good people and bad people in motorcycle clubs, in law enforcement, in politics. You can't stereotype and just look at somebody and say, oh, they're guilty because they have a vest on with patches. Mm -hmm. I have friends that are in motorcycle clubs that are Christian outlaw motorcycle clubs and beyond. And it's funny how when nobody has a problem with motorcyclists doing runs, toy runs, that you know, doing things to help people. But if you were to walk in a room and there's a bunch of men and women with leather coats on, and, and nobody's going to take the time to read what their patches say. You don't know what they're involved in. Everybody just automatically looks at somebody and thinks the worst of them. And I'm sorry I wasn't raised that way. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. People should take the time to find out more about somebody. They're, you know, Don't judge a book by its cover because you might miss a really good story. Right. But now that's why... And for the FBI to be involved, they they needed a RICO Act, so they had to find, you know, a pagan. Right. And so they picked Freddie, because Freddie knew Jim and April. He had done work for them. Um, signage, did stuff at her little uh, cafe thing that was in Northfield there. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's not denying he ever knew them. He did know them. But he had nothing to do with ever wanting to hurt her. Right. It was complete now, opposite, actually. Now, like you, you were talking about, you know, let me swing it around here. You were talking about uh, April was trying to expose the corruption. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, uh, the corruption that you guys were trying to expose. 
Well, as I was saying, she was involved a lot with veterans. Matter of fact, the week before she was murdered, she even got a very prestigious award in, in from the state in New Jersey. And I, I have a real problem with anyone that attempts stolen valor. And there's a lot of reasons for that, one of which being I have a folded flag in my house um, in a glass case. My stepfather is a 20-year Purple Heart Air Force veteran that really was in Vietnam. And I do a lot with the U.S. I've been involved with the USO for decades. I've done a lot of volunteer work myself. Mm. So I have a real problem considering what our men and women in uniform go through and how they're treated on a daily basis as it is for somebody to, he went and bought fake uh, Purple Heart and other crap off of the internet. I'm sorry, even the people selling them should be arrested. That's just so wrong in my book. I can't even begin to tell you. Now, this was the prosecutor you guys were trying to expose, right? That was No, the... Jim Kaufman, April's husband. Oh, okay, Jim Kaufman. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, he went around. He even had, a, like I said, he bought fake medals and stuff off the Internet and told everybody he had been in Vietnam, that he had brought, you know, um, things home for the family members. He was full of shit, and I proved it. Sounds, and Sounds like a piece of shit doing that. Anybody who does stolen violence. Right, that's what I mean. And not to sidetrack off that, but like when he did a deposition in 2014 with Pat DRC and them, I'm sorry, somebody should have reported him there after they had it on oath that he was lying, and he was never a vet. Like, there's just so much wrong, I'm telling you. There's just so much wrong, and I'm sorry if people listening in or scratching their head or their ass or whatever else right now trying to figure out what the hell is this woman saying. And I'm, I'm really sorry that it's all over the place, but it is, it's like so big that there's no script for this. I'm sorry. Mm. Hang, hang with us. You'll, you'll understand by the end of the <laughs> all right. You can play it back and listen to it a couple times, I guess, down the road and, and put two and two together. So I right. apologize. If, so you guys were trying to expose these fakes and her husband was one of them. We were just, uh, April and I were going to expose Jim. That, that's what this was about. It, I don't know about other people like that were, if I, anytime I've come across people that lie, yeah, do I report them? Yes, I do. That's for stolen valor. Um, it, this wasn't anything about drugs. Um, she even did drugs. So why would she report somebody or get other people involved? Like, she did drugs. Mm -hmm. I used to do drugs. Um None of this is ever, like, nobody ever wanted to talk about this. But this is just the cold, hard facts. Sorry. Like I said, if this hurts somebody, but it, this has to come out. Mm. Um, we what, were, what, what got There was even a letter. I, I think I provided you with the letter. I had no idea that was in the discovery either. Right. They have the proof in the discovery, and I had refused to look at the 196 disks of discovery all last year because I didn't want anything to be prejudiced, like prejudice what I had to say and what I had been saying. Mm -hmm. So I refused to look at anything. In December, I got the discovery. And when I started looking at things, like, I almost had a heart attack. Like, I've had seizures from this, everything. Like, you don't mm -hmm. know. Like, everything I said can be verified in the discovery, right. and then some. What made April get to the point where she thought she had to expose him? She was a victim of domestic abuse, just like I was. And he had threatened her before. They didn't have a happy marriage. Uh, there was adultery. There was all kinds of things going on there. And as a victim of domestic abuse myself, I was trying to help her any way I could, because like, cause this had nothing to do with Jim losing half of his empire or whatever the hell the prosecutor and everybody kept trying to say, like, he was going to lose half his empire, that's why he had her murder. No, he was going to lose everything, and she was okay with that. She had already accepted that fact. There were other people in the area that were backing her up as well, that she would have been okay. She really would have been okay if mm. he didn't murder her. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Um... Was she was, was she going to expose him on her show? No, we were going. Like I said, I have people in the military. Um, I know people in places, and we were going to do whatever we wherever we had to go to mm -hmm. the officials to prove that he was doing that, and also she 
did know about the the bit with um, some of the extracurricular things he was doing that were corrupt through his business, like with the, mm-hmm. the prescription cream and, and stuff like was, that. And was he under investigation during this time? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Mm-hmm. He was never under investigation up until... Well, no, let me back up. Originally, when she was murdered, they they were on, the prosecutor's office was on the right track. They pretty much, if if people go back and read Michael Mattioli and other people, he was a detective from the prosecutor's office. If you read the original paperwork from 2012, you will see they were on the right track. However. April's daughter, Kimberly Pack, had relations with Michael Mattioli from the prosecutor's office, the lead detective. He was pulled off the case. Mm -hmm. And since other people don't want things in their own personal life exposed to other people in the area... Mm-hmm. They kind of pushed it to the side. Like people were, people were told like not to work on it. Like people were taken off. Like you know, and Jim wasn't pursuing anything like who murdered my wife or anything because he knew who murdered his wife. Mm-hmm. It was mm, so wrong. So okay, wrong. so she was. Uh, where was she found shot? In her bedroom. In her bedroom. Okay. Yes, yeah, they had separate bedrooms. In separate bedrooms. And she was found in her bedroom on the floor with two bullet wounds Mm -hmm. um, in her. And they tried to say that she was murdered in the morning. I want to say like six o'clock in the morning around that area. And like I said, I'm not looking at anything right now to, you know, easily reference, which, you right. know, we can do that on the next segment well, or something. What, what, what was his, uh, the forensics uh, that they did, uh, you know, with the scene? I'm interested in knowing, was there force entry? Was there no. not force entry? Okay, there wasn't. Uh, no, what no was force his- entry, but see, there was a man that used to go to the house. They had exotic birds. Mm. The story is, like, so weird. Like, you couldn't make this shit up. See, they had birds, just like Ed Jacobs has the same birds. And the bird man would come, you know, to clean the cages, do the, whatever the bird people do. Right. Um, so supposedly, like, they would leave the door unlocked, you know, for him to come in and out. But, uh, no, there was no forced entry. There was no big mess. But what, what people would might find is, like, let me tell you, like, stuff that's red flags, I guess, as we go along. Mm-hmm. She, when she was found, like, if you look at the autopsy and you look at other things, um, like, she supposedly, Jim said, and well, that she was like found, and well, they were saying, I'm so sorry. Um, she was found, supposedly, she was sleeping, and Frances Mulholland went in and shot her twice and left. But the bathtub was full, her bladder was empty, the DNA results that Judge DeLore sealed Mm -hmm. um, because Ed Jacobs fought last, well, this is over a year now, 2018, after he was arrested for the other crap, then they wanted to get his DNA and stuff to to compare it to shit from the murder. And Ed Jacobs argued that, and Judge DeLore sealed it. Okay, but I'm going to tell you what it says. It says that the DNA under her fingernails on her hand um, match Jim, and it's going to say the blood on a blanket in his bedroom match his and her blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm um, 99% sure on who the vaginal swab, swab would match, but I don't feel like throwing that person under the bus right now. Mm-hmm. Was, so, there, was there gunpowder residue? Was there any uh, type of uh, resistance on her part? The scratches on her arm, on wait, on, the DNA on her two fingernails matched the scratches that were on his arm that were witnessed by the police officer and Kim Pack the day after the murder when he had a polo shirt on. Mm-hmm. But that was sealed. I don't know why. Like, hello? 
mm-hmm. news flash, like, hello. And they, the whole thing with being shot and killed at 6 in the morning, there have been three different medical examiners that clearly state due to, and I'm not a medical professional, but mm-hmm. how they go by everything, that she died at, like, 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. So the whole story of Joseph Mulholland driving Francis Mulholland over there at 6 in the morning to shoot her is a lie. And it can be proven. It's, a, it's just an outright lie. This is only made-up story that everybody's heard so far. I think there were four bullet holes in the wall, and there was one downstairs in the dining room. Um, yeah. So, so there was four. How many shots were fired? If they, I, if they all came at the same time, four. Mm-hmm. But everybody's saying, first of all, anything, anybody that got on the witness stand in Freddie's trial and said anything about what Francis Mahomes supposedly said or did, it's hearsay. Mm-hmm. But the public defenders, that's a whole, we'll get to them too. They, they sucked. They, I don't know, they're corrupt as well. There's, everybody's in cahoots with one another on, you know, oh, if you do this for us, we'll do this for you down the road type mm-hmm. of deal. Well, so they didn't even fight for Freddie. They well, really didn't. What, what I'm interested in knowing is uh, the time of death. What did they put the time of death at? It's like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the it's like or, or like after midnight, one, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. So obviously they didn't go in and shoot her at 6 in the morning. Right. Okay. Now, where did the 6 in the morning story come from? I, I don't know if when Dan Garibrandt and Jim Scopa were making up this big story. I guess they didn't go back and read too much or read the fine print on things. It, since Jim leaves for work, at, he was a doctor, and besides his own office, he'd go to Shore Memorial Hospital in Summers Point and see, you know, make your rounds before he went to the office. He would always leave at, like, between 5, 30, 6 o'clock in there in the morning to go to the hospital and do his rounds and then go to his office. So the story that they made up was when he left for work, that's when Francis Mulholland went in and shot her. Mm-hmm. But the time and of death was placed right after about midnight. So correct. where was his whereabouts between, you know, where, what was his alibi, you know, between that uh, time, between uh, after midnight to six? Well, they never asked him that because uh, he went MIA, I guess, and it, they just kept saying that it happened at six in the morning. Nobody ever argued, like Mary Linehan and Omar representing Freddie. Like, there's so much. I should have represented them and had somebody like legally blonde just have a lawyer with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. there's just so much wrong. There's- well, well, what I'm wondering is, uh, does he? Did they have any proof that he was at these other places, at this other hospital, doing rounds? Uh, where was he? Well, there's proof that he went to Shore Memorial. You got him with you sliding his car for parking and going into the hospital and into the doctor's lounge and and that stuff, and then going to his office. However, things that have come, like things that were told to the public about, like he's even when you hear the, if you listen to the nine one when he called nine one one. Um, the Lim, or Linwood Police Department saying, oh, I heard my wife got shot, and he's saying he was at his doctor's office and he was on his way there. No, actually, he was outside Mainland High School, and he's on the surveillance from the high school. So, so he, he, he was lying. He was lying all over the place, even, even when it happened. Okay, so uh, they caught him on surveillance video. Did anybody, did his, def, uh, you know, Freddie's defense, you know, public pretenders, uh, <laughs> question any of the people at uh, this hospital about his... Uh, you know, the way he was acting, uh, was he acting normal, was he nervous, uh, any of that type of stuff? I guess you would have to ask them. I don't have a copy of the public defender's office um, file. Mm-hmm. However, I can speak on my own behalf and say that I went to the public defender's office as soon as uh, Freddie and Paul Pagano, everybody was arrested and asked for Scott Sherwood, who is the supervisor in the Atlantic County mm-hmm. uh, Public Defender's Office, met with him there. I marched my ass into the courthouse twice to find him because I was, and there, you've gotten copies of the emails that went back and forth where they never sent an investigator out and never had me back in to question stuff with me. 
So I don't know who they questioned. I, I know that the two days that I did show up at the trial, which there's a reason I didn't go back for that either, um, that they didn't do their job. Mm-hmm. They should be fired. That's like $4,000, whatever it is, between the Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right. and they suck. Like, they, they're, no, they did not do their job. Mm-hmm. And, Fre- so. and Freddie was forced to uh, have uh, a public uh, pretender? Yes, because he wasn't the one selling. He wasn't the big drug dealer like Andrew Glick and other people, so he didn't have the funds. Did no, I was ju- I was just wondering. Did the, you know? I was. I'm kind yeah, of but that explains that why the... he was the only one that had a public defender. Right. He was doing stuff. He was living his life, uh, doing signage and playing his guitar around. Like he wasn't a millionaire. He, mm-hmm. just, he wasn't. Well, he I'm, didn't have the fun I'm, I'm just it. I'm just surprised that uh, the motorcycle club didn't help get him a lawyer. But well, you know that's something we could talk about later on. Uh but so we got you know a time of death that uh, after midnight around one o'clock. They're saying it happened about six o'clock. You got this guy uh, going to his work. They got him on rounds. They got him on surveillance. Uh, you know, I'd really love to get my hands on the nine one one tape for the next episode if we can. You know, if that's been publicly released yet, do you know? Yes. Okay. I think it's even on the twenty twenty special. <laughs> And then not a good one. I think this is going to be the first time in history that 2020 is going to have to apologize to their viewers and redo their show because mm. the one they gave is full. Right. That was all. That was all a shit show as well. Like Damon Tyner and them were Damon and them were recording the episode in March before the indictments ever came down. Every time I usually watch Dateline or 2020, it's like after the fact. Mm. They just went all out to try to make themselves famous. Like, this is crazy. And then, of course, when Freddie starts posting stuff on, on Facebook, they give him a gag order. Mm-hmm. What? Right. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, Just like how the suicide note was leaked and the defense and other people supposedly didn't have it yet either. That came out of the prosecutor's office. And, of course, Andrew Glick, remember, he, uh, the FBI and then... Well, 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 we can get to Andrew in a second. What yeah. I want to do is bring the audience through, uh, you know, the events and stuff like that. How did the events unfold that day when the murder and, uh, you know, she was found dead? How did, you know, the investigation proceed there? The, the police showed up, the, like Linwood police. They had uh, people from the prosecutor's office and, and different ones go like you would, I guess, to any other murder. They never put the mainland high school, which is like in walking distance from where they lived on lockdown or anything. They didn't think it was something like, you know, that you had to worry about a murderer running around, which that wasn't really smart either. And if I had had a student there, I would have been complaining. Mm -hmm. Um, They went through, they took a couple pictures. They had a couple, uh, Barbara Greenling, that was the nurse practitioner that worked with Jim was over there, Kimberly Pack, um, April's friend, and there, Kim had even said she had texted her mom that day and got a text back, and somebody went in her purse when she was at the house, because they went and sat outside, and deleted her one message, even though you could see, like, her responding to a message, the message that came from April's phone was no longer there, it was deleted. Mm -hmm. Who discovered the body again? The Birdman. The Birdman? Okay. Did he have any connections to Freddie or anybody? No. Okay. He specifically worked for, you know, goes around doing with people that have birds. Okay. (laughs) Now, you know, the investigation's unfolding. Now, when was the first arrest made? And who was it? It was January 9th. Of 2018, and it was Freddie Ogello, Paul Pagano, Joseph Mahon, Glenn Steeler, Beverly Ogello, Tabitha Chapman, and Cheryl Pizza. And how long was this after the discovery of the body? I'm just trying to give a timeline. Six years. It was six years after the murder? Yes. Wow, so this was like a cold case to them. Yeah, that's why he wanted to be famous with it. Mm. But it really wasn't, it wasn't cold. 
Everybody knew, just nobody was supposed to act on it. Mm -hmm. For six years, her husband went around with no uh, attention on him, no scrutiny, no nothing? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. And this was... And I was afraid... He, he even was... Um, ended up marrying... Carol Weintraub. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah. They were, they're like Charles and Camilla, if you want to refer them to a couple that, you know, were, were together and then got married to other people mm -hmm. and got back together. And But, like, yeah, they're like Charles and Camilla. That's a whole other... We'll get to that. Right. <laughs> uh, well, but no, he went around traveled, did everything, uh, and even did more with regards to uh, the prescriptions and that kind of corruption after she died. So during the six years' time, or you know what, immediately after, because, you know, most of that time the, the cops or whoever it is, they zero in on the husband, or if it's the husband that's dead, they zero in on the wife. What kind of scrutiny did they give them after this murder? Not very much. Well, of course, like the day after it happened, he called Ed Jacobs. And Ed Jacobs is well known as one of the state and, I guess, nation's top mafia lawyers, like top criminal lawyers. Mm. He, you, you call him, and I, well, I guess we, I, I, we should pause and say, for the record, I've been a paralegal and, and in the legal field for the last 30 years in South Jersey, and I used to work for Ed Jacobs and Lou Barbone, amongst other people. So let me throw that in there, <laughs> I guess. Cause right. People, I forget people are listening that have no idea who I am and so did what he, I'm talking did about. So did he automatically lawyer, lawyer up? Yes, within a day. You don't call Ed unless you're guilty of something and want to get off. I'm sorry. That's just the cold hard fact. Everybody knows it. Mm hmm I mean, they, they do some other stuff, but, te you know, that everybody, knows, everybody knows it. So, of course, yeah. Do you know but, how many times, do you know how many times he was interviewed by the local cops or any of that stuff after the murder? I haven't seen any, like, video testimony of him in the prosecutor's office or the FBI. He was just interviewed by the police at the scene and, and things of that nature that I can tell, like, for... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't dug through all of the discovery because it's very upsetting, and knowing it's a lie, it like I don't even need to. Re I don't need to read it. And every time I do sit down to try to go through something, like like have heart palpitations because it's just more mm -hmm. corruption and and shit that I look at. Because even the guys at the FBI were telling me that oh, we can't corroborate any of your story. The hell you can't! Mm -hmm. I laughed at the man. I've been abused by the FBI interview so bad you don't even know. Well, I'm, you know, I'm really interesting, you know, because, again, you know, most of the time they look at the spouse or somebody that's close to the victim. Uh, did this doctor have any connections? Was he friends? Did he go to country clubs with any of these cops investigating this thing? Yes. Okay. And a lot of a lot of people that uh, are in law enforcement in South Jersey are involved in other things as well. No, oh, we all so, know that. <laughs> yeah, every, 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 you know, you protect your friend. That's kind of the reason I showed up at the FBI to begin with on January 2nd of 2018 was because of problems in my own world with the police um, not protecting me and helping me. Mm -hmm. And it was because my husband is related to some and played softball with all of them. So they, you know, were trying to make it out like I was the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's uh, kind of like what they were doing here. So Everybody's this, in cahoots with one another. Protect your friend. So this goes on. He's not really looked at any of that stuff. Uh, the forensics, they had all that. Uh, but he, it, this goes for six years. Yes. Uh, how did they make a jump to the pagans? Well, like I said, uh Glenn, Andrew Glick, different, there are different ones that were going to him and getting Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm wondering is, because I know a lot of those patient records and stuff are off limits unless there's court order. Was there uh, an investigation going on behind the scenes where they were getting grand jury, getting all that kind of stuff going? Yes. Okay. 
So, so they were able to get records, and just because, you know, a couple of uh, guys that were in a motorcycle club were his patients, that's how they made that jump? Yes. Okay. Okay. And like I said, had they not blamed it on a pagan and made this whole story up, then the feds wouldn't have been involved with the RICO Act. Mm-hmm. So it was the locals who did the connection, then all of a sudden the... Uh, Forever Bother Italian police came in. Yes. Okay. Okay. When did they take over the investigation? <sighs> For the murder, I would have to say the summer of 2017. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you're talking about Rico. Now, with the FBI... I, they're, did they just use the murder as a catalyst for whatever else you know they were going after the club for? Yes. Okay. Was that the was that in the initial thing in Freddie's trial? Was hey, you know, he was national president, and that's you know where they wanted to go with this. Yes. This was they they this was all to paint this really scary picture of people in motorcycle clubs, like the media unfortunately does. Well, I don't follow it worldwide, but uh, you look at the, like I said before, you look at motorcycle clubs and, you know, people are like scared to death and it's because of the media, Mm -hmm. the media putting out bullshit. Like I said, there are, are there bad people in motorcycle clubs? Yes. But there are bad people in the police department. There are bad people everywhere. There are bad people in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, But that doesn't mean you should accuse someone of something they never did. Mm-hmm. That's just wrong. Do you know the age of this Andrew Glick? You know, I'm sure I can find it out, but at, you know, how old he was at the time of this supposed uh, murder and then when they finally uh, started squeezing him? How old is he now? I'll look it up, but I'm going to say 40s. Is he in witness protection, do you know? I really don't know where he is right now, and some of my peeps aren't communicating. And people are boycotting me, obviously, because I just know way too much about way too much, and nobody wants to get involved and get in trouble, and I respect certain people. I know he sold his house in Egg Harbor Township um, is maybe he a doing any, ago. Is he doing any, any jail time? No. Yeah, he wasn't charged with anything. Yeah, he's in they, When they arrested him um, in the fall of 2017, they got him with $37,000 in cash, a shitload of guns from mm-hmm. Florida, wherever the hell he brought them from, and all kinds of drugs. So, like, they're so they should have just they, arrested they, him for that, but he didn't get charged with shit. And then the FBI and prosecutor's office were writing him checks last year each month to pay his bills. Yeah, I couldn't he, even get food stamps. Yeah, but they, they were giving him thousands of dollars a month to pay his bills yeah, after they, they had just got all that from him. They gave him an immunity deal. Uh, did he vanish off the face of the earth? I do not know. I uh, can't honestly answer that. Yeah, because if he vanished, he's in witness protection. Uh, so how, you know. I, know you can put, I, I, I still want to see what happens um, and I haven't Googled it to find out. Like, I'd like to know how many people have been put into federal witness protection program and then brought the hell out and charged with shit, especially perjury. It, like, talk about egg on your face. Yeah, the FBI. All right. That's Did a, a serious problem you know, right now. in the next session, we're going to be getting into Freddie's actual trial and all that type of stuff. But, you know, the prelude that uh, did Andrew Glick uh, testify on the stand against Freddie? Yes, he did. Okay. Days. Days worth. And I wasn't going to go to the trial. Uh, I really prayed about it. I didn't go the Monday it started. I went Tuesday in the afternoon. And, like, after lunchtime, and I get to the courthouse, and I go in and go to put my purse up on the conveyor belt. There's nobody around. And the two sheriff's officers standing there, and the one's like, hello, I'm like, hello, and the other one's like, Miss Clone. And I was like, yes. <laughs> How would you know that? Is there an APP out of me? Mm-hmm. Sure enough, they had had a meeting in the sheriff's department. Everybody was on the lookout for me, like a bolo, whatever the hell you call it these days. And I had to have an armed sheriff's officer walk around with me the entire time I was in the courthouse, but it wasn't for my protection. It was for everyone else's. Right. I never even had that type of protection when I did go to trials with Ed Jacobs and Lou Barbone, and we had, like, some major-ass criminal clients. Never. Never. Mm -hmm. That's more harassment. And then I went back that Thursday 
same thing again when I go in. Here comes my, you know, bodyguard. And I was, I said a few things. You don't even want to know what I said. Mm-hmm. And I go home. Monday, the two state troopers show up at my house and take me to the psych ward. Yeah. <laughs> because they got Egyptian off the street so he wouldn't be around for the trial because they were scared he was going to say or do something. Yeah, and they well, tried we're, the we're same thing with me. We're going to talk about the, uh, what happened to Egyptian uh, in the next episode. My, you know, in this one, as far as Andrew's concerned, the rat, as I call them, I think we've done an actual couple articles on him. Was he under investigation for anything else before all this came down? I did you did they you know, know cross examine him at uh, you know trial because usually the defense is able to uh, see when the deals were cut if you know they were being investigated by the either the feds or the cops before. No, and it's my understanding, and and this is hearsay. I haven't looked this up or verified this. And if I do tell you things, which is even what I did in the FBI and everywhere else, like if I tell you something and it's hearsay, I'll tell you first it's hearsay. Mm. So just so we got get it straight. It's my understanding that he did the same shit when he lived in another state. And what state so he's, that? He's, this is, I guess, how he makes a living. Do what you gotta do, and when you get caught, just tell on people, even if you're lying. Um, well, that's what yeah. a lot of, a lot of uh, federal informants do. Uh, you know, Falco is a big one. Uh, that this, you know, there, Charles Falco, he went from club to club to club because he, he had to work off of beef and stuff, and they were treating him like a king. Uh, but that's kind of what uh, Andrew Glick sounds like. Uh, what did Glick do for a living on paper? He was a chef. A chef. And hence, that's where his club name comes from, Chef. Okay. He was, was working was at there, a now, old folks' home in Ocean City, New Jersey, as a chef. So he had uh, experience with uh, knives and cut- cutlery, right? Correct. Okay. It's like the Swedish chef. <laughs> right. <laughs> Looks just like him, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was, you know, you probably don't know this, or, you know, I can look it up in news reports. What was his position in the club where he was as close to a national president? Well, Freddie was his predecessor, and I don't know if Freddie was national, but Freddie was president of the Cape May chapter. Mm-hmm. And then Andrew Glick took over. Okay. So, so he was actually president oh, when okay. the shit went down. Right, okay. Not Freddie. And when we get in further to stuff, like, went down, you know, um, it would explain why he would go ask Freddie questions or advice, just like you would do at a, at a regular job. Like, you know, somebody had the job before you and you don't know something, you go ask questions. So that makes sense, but that, that'll that come up later, but you get what I'm saying. But, right. you know, he was president of the club. Okay, so... Glenn Steeler was the sergeant at arms. I, I don't remember the rest, but that was their position. Did I know him. Did Andrew, did it come up through a trial? Did, was there tapes of him talking with uh, Freddie? Yes, that's what they used in the trial. Okay. But, um... I obviously listened to them and watched them and all that good stuff, and I draw a different conclusion from them than what the prosecutor is trying to say they they took out of the same. Was there, a, on those tapes, was there any, you know, anything with Freddie talking about the murder, talking about, hey, arranging this, how to get away with it, blah, blah, blah? No, he repeatedly says I, he has nothing to do with it. And, of course... The prosecutor, part of their game plan was they had Ed Jacobs orchestrate a letter to show him that the Ed, Ed typed up a letter that said to look at Freddie Ogello and Francis Mahalan as in having something to do with April's murder. And they showed that to Freddie to say, look, they're, they're looking at you. And he kept saying, well, why the fuck are they looking at me? Like, I had nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It wasn't a club thing. So, like, that, it makes sense if you know the whole story to be like, I would be saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. And then when, you know, that, that was a farce. That letter was a farce. So there was that nothing was- in them tapes with Freddie saying, hey, you know, you got to do this or you got to hide this or no. none of that stuff. He was on no. tape denying, hey, I had nothing to do with this. What are you asking me about this for? Correct. 
Okay. Okay. Very, and like, very well. I, I think there might be one or two comments. And like when uh, Andrew was bringing up about like taking the doctor out while he was incarcerated because Jim Kaufman was, was arrested, like I said. Well, actually, he pulled a gun out on the police, even there was a stand, like, kind of standoff and in the summer when they had arrested him in 2017. So this is the fall of that year. They show him a letter, and Andrew's like, yeah, well, I'm, you know, should we take this guy out? Like, I think he made a remark, and like, I'm not doing it verbatim because I'm obviously not looking at it right now or anything. But who, who made that remark? Was it Andrew or Freddie? Andrew Blick was making the remark about, like, maybe having him poisoned in the jail, things of that nature. And I think, like I said, don't quote me, I think Freddie made a remark back, like, you know, whatever. Like, but I probably would have said the same thing at that point if I knew somebody was trying to frame me for a murder, and this guy's saying, well, you know, I might, whatever. You know, I'm not going to, like... Say, oh no! Like, do you know what I mean? Like, if you're in like that situation at that moment to say something like that wasn't. But Andrew Glick then admitted on the stand when I was there at the trial that day that there really was never any plan and there was no hit out on Jim Kaufman in the jail. And that was the day I was like, oh my fucking god, I gotta walk out because I'm gonna lose it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, he's admitting it like this was a lie, and I told them there was no hit by the pagan or anybody like like so they you know, what if jim really did die hello mm. then like they scared him to death they mm. there was a hit out on him and there really wasn't right so he lied it, it, it's just so many lies that so it, it kind of sounds like you know this andrew uh the rat uh was trying to go t- uh he was wired up then he was. Yeah, already, he was. He was Dan Garibrand and Jim Scopa, the FBI guy and the prosecutor guy that, that are in charge of this shit show, um, are the ones that would meet him and put the thing on him. Mm. And he even had the balls the one day to put it, a little card in a jacket that had belonged to Freddie Ogello's dad that he had given Andrew Glick. Man. That's not right. There's nothing right about any of this, but like, who does that? Well, it don't, it don't sound like it because a lot of what we've been talking about uh, on this episode. It don't seem right whatsoever. The police work was garbage. It was. And I had told them, Dan Garibrandt, that day when I originally went to the FBI, things I was telling them, you, this was before anybody was arrested, uh, things I told them you could not Google, and, like, you had to know the things that I told him. But, of course, I did not know when I went to the FBI on January 2nd that... Dan Garibrandt was going to throw everything I gave him away, including the intake sheet and copy of my ID, Mm -hmm. and make it like I never went there. And I put on my big girl panties and got a hold of Ed Jacobs and Lou Barbone and went and met Lou off the record uh, to tell them I went to the FBI because I figured, well, they're going to find out anyway. I might as well let them know first. Mm -hmm. And then Dan... (laughs) Dan Garibrandt never told the men in corruptions I was there. And if I hadn't been persistent... Um, they would have, the guys in corruption, Michael Alton and Ryan Ripley would have never known I had been there on January 2nd. Right. So that's the, like the most major red flag and had Freddie's idiots done their job. Like that's the first thing they say, who goes to the FBI? First of all, not too many normal people. Second of all, where's her shit? Where, what do you mean it's missing? Like you th- threw it away? Like, hello, mm. that, that presents a problem. It was because I was telling the truth. For the first time in six years of what happened, because I did, I stayed behind the scenes. I wouldn't go to a memorial service for her. I wouldn't go to anything because I felt guilty. I felt guilty for her murder because I was going to, like, more like I said, if you don't expose them, I am. Like, like I felt guilty. I wanted nobody to know what was really, what really happened. So I just, but my daughter's. My mother, there are plenty of people that will tell you, especially when he did murder and it came on the news, I dropped to the ground. And my daughters will tell you, like, mm-hmm. but I didn't come out and say anything. I, for years, I was, I was just taking this shit with me to the grave. And then when they went and arrested, like, like Dan Garibrandt pissed me off. That's why I said something. Mm-hmm. That's why. Because the man was an asshole, and he's like, when I'm telling him about why I'm there, I tried to go up the judicial ladder. It started out with the Egg Harbor and Mullica police, to the prosecutor's office, to the sheriff's department, all the way up to the FBI, the, the state police. When I tell you I tried to go up the judicial ladder properly, um, it's 
that's what I did. I tried to do everything properly, and when Dan Garibrant came out on January 2nd, he was a lucky individual. And he's sitting there with me, didn't even take me in the interview room, just sat there. He could have been drawing a caricature of me, for all I know, on his legal pad. And he was like, well, I'm going to have to pass your information under the men in corruption. Mm. I only deal with violent crimes. And excuse my English, but you can listen to it. This is what I said. I was like, okay, then, do you want to know about some fucking violent crimes then? Do you know what the fuck I'm talking about? And I went on to tell him about April's murder. Right. And then he threw everything away because it didn't match the, the storyline. They did not expect some stupid bitch, I guess, to walk into the FBI and blow their big, uh, you know, storyline. But here I was, and okay, what do we do with her? Mm. So they threw everything away and then have tried to make it after the fact. Even their supervisor, Ed Gallant, at the North Field office of the FBI, he was the one that told me like, a couple of months later, but we couldn't verify anything. Mm. Oh, I said, um, mm-hmm. Man. Alrighty then. Well, You're another one on the list. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to come to the end of this episode. Uh, we got a lot of great background. Uh, the next episode on Saturday, we're going to go into the actual trial of Freddie. Uh, some of the stuff that was said on the witness stand, uh, the prosecution's case, uh, you know, the half-assed defense that uh, the public pretenders put out. And we're really going to dig in hard uh, on this and uh, see if we can get uh, Freddie some help. Maybe uh, the Innocence Project, uh, hopefully they're going to hear this. I reached out to them, believe me, I have... My next thing is to get a hold of Donald Trump, our president, because I used to work for him when opening the Taj Mahal. I actually was like the first person to use Mark Edis' office after he died in the helicopter crash. So I've never um, like called on him for a favor, but he's in the posi- he's at the top, I guess. So and he has problems with the FBI himself, so he might actually enjoy uh, helping me. I don't know. I don't. I've tried everything I can. To not go end up on mugshots.com. Mm. But now that people are listening around the world, yes, if there's anybody out there that can help, <laughs> there's no innocence project in New Jersey. Mm. The attorney general's office just started something for wrongful conviction, supposedly. And I even offered, you know, because this was never about my I said, hey, I'll, I, vol- like, I could use a job. I'll go there. You want somebody that knows their shit and can, and can do the job properly and has their heart in it? Have I heard back? No. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, I thank you for coming on, uh, Patty, and uh, we're going to get you on another episode. Like I said, uh, we're going to piggyback Part these. Two. <laughs> yeah, we're going to piggyback uh, these and get the truth out there because it's uh, god awful somebody uh, being convicted for something they didn't do just because they didn't have a money for a good lawyer to put up a, you know, a right defense. And you know, any, you know, if you had Alan Dershowitz or something in uh, on this trial, he probably would have tore him apart. So, uh, but yeah. yeah, and it's sad because had Freddie had Ed, I know Ed would have gotten him off. And I guess Ed shouldn't have represented Jim Kaufman. It's, this is kind of funny just to end, I guess, with, but they had a saying, uh, one of the lawyers that worked there at the Christmas party back in, I think, 1999, 2000, had done a poem about Jacobs and Barbone. And it said, at Jacobs and Barbone, we don't throw in the towel, especially if our client's last name ends in a vowel. Right. <laughs> Rock so on. They should have represented Freddie. <laughs> there you go. Well, I thanks for coming on, Patty, and uh, I'll catch you on Thank the next you. episode. With that, uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we will be back, and we'll have some... May I have your attention, please? <laughs> Need your daily dose of biker news? Then what are you waiting for? Visit HarleyLiberty.com and keep up to date with all the happenings in the biker scene. And wait! There's more. Insane Throttle Biker News is now on Instagram. Come on over and give us a follow and get special video content not seen elsewhere on the net. Just type in Insane Throttle Biker News in the search bar. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24 7, 24 7. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. Hollywood's Motorcycle Madhouse on Spotify and iTunes Radio. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, 
Hopefully you guys enjoyed the interview. Why the interview was going on, I actually got your letter, Freddie. It was just handed to me now. Uh, I'll be taking a look at that, uh, seeing what we can do for you, and getting the information out there. This whole story sounds screwed up, if you ask me. Uh, so, yeah, Freddie, we're going to be out there uh, trying to help with you. Uh, we'll start digging around and uh, getting into a lot of uh, the questions uh, that were raised by this, as well as, you know, why you had to have a public defender, man. That uh, really confuses the shit out of me. But uh, going on, I want to thank uh, the Kazak 1%ers. They sent over a uh, support shirt. Uh, it's awesome when all the clubs, all the guests send over the shirts and stuff like that. If you want your shirt on, uh, air, just send them over to me. I'll, you know, get a hold of me and I'll do it to you. But it's a real awesome shirt. It's the Flat Eagles crew. Uh, awesome stuff. I'm actually going to go down, uh, to Texas. I asked them the other day, hey man, you guys got any feral hunting down there? Uh, and you know, you know, pigs are known. I want to go hunt a pig, man. That's the only thing I haven't hunted yet. And those wild pigs are supposed to be something else. So I'm going to go hunting down in, uh, Texas. Uh, go see the Kazakh one percenters, hang with them a little bit. And, uh, you know. Have some parties, man. You know, I heard Mac can party it up. And, uh, yeah, you better have a honey waiting for me, Mac, if I go down there. <laughs> anyway, uh, before I get into uh, some of the callers, uh, some of their stuff, uh, yeah, you can leave us a message at 847-957-1656. Uh, it, we, we might choose you to go on the air, and I might choose to, uh, to respond to you. Uh, other than that, you know, you can tell us your beefs, bitches, if we're doing good, any of that good stuff. <laughs> but uh, don't forget our event that we will be uh, broadcasting from April 2nd through the 4th. Uh, it's going to be in Black River Falls. And this event, you'll see the event page on Insane Throttle. Yeah, it's going to be something. So if you do not like nudity or don't like adult fun, I wouldn't uh, suggest coming to this thing, but it's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have the second part of Freddie's, uh, inter or, uh, the interview with uh, Patty, who is a paralegal. She's real smart. And it's real cool that uh, Freddie has somebody that's uh, backing him like uh, her. So, awesome stuff there. But let's play a uh, uh, voicemail we received real quick. The interesting thing on the San Antonio FBI release regarding motorcycle clubs in that area is the warning, which you didn't read. The warning issued by law enforcement itself, which says this is not vetted information. Basically, it says everything we're reporting here is a rumor. You guys have a thing about who's controlling the narrative in 2019 as far as motorcycle clubs are related? It's law enforcement, period. And you're just spreading their narrative. Shame on you. Okay, and that has to be in the response to that FBI memo that we got leaked to us. And if you actually listen to the episode caller, it will say in there that, hey, look at this. This is rumor. We put it on there as well as it came from a UI, so you better watch out. And it, it, it's funny, you know, because I've been getting a couple messages. Hey, you know, why are you letting people know about what they have to say? Clubs have to know what they are being talked about. That's why we put the memo out there. Because this is what Leo's saying. You want If it wasn't for us, that leak memo wouldn't be out there. And the clubs wouldn't know what's going on. You know, I always find it funny. You know, the supporters. And I'm talking about supporters of clubs here. Not the MC members. Because the MC members... They're really cool. They love talking to us. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff because of our confidentiality, we won't let nothing out. Uh, so they know they can trust us. They love being able to get their side of the story out. It's only the supporters of clubs that are dingbats. Okay? They get on their high horse thinking they're actually helping the club by throwing a bitch like that when, in essence, they're hurting them. Okay, you don't know how many calls I got from MC members 
and the one percent uh, ones by that I'm talking all the big ones that said hey man that was cool letting us know what's going on uh, with that memo it's good uh, thinking uh, you know inside thinking of what Leo's talking about but again then you get a supporter calling <laughs> that really don't know what the hell they're talking about or what the premise of the show is all about you know and this is what I gotta say to you supporter your mother sucks fucking big fucking elephant dicks you got that yeah you got that that's what it is man you gotta listen to Joe uh, you gotta know what you're talking about before you make a call like that, because I have said a million times over and over again, uh, if you leave us a message and if we choose to, we will play it on air. And it's something like that is just pure ignorance. Pure ignorance. To, uh, know what the heck you're talking about and the reason behind what was done. And everybody knows that we support motorcycle club rights like no other. But everybody else again knows that we are down the middle and we make sure that we report what's going on in the club scene, good or bad. My favorite saying is, if you don't want to be put in a bad light on Insane Throttle, then don't be in the news. We won't, if you're not in the news, there's nothing to say. But that... That's the thing about being an independent uh, publication, and, and grant you, uh, you know, 98% of the people out there love how we uh, handle the programming and stuff, just like uh, the, biker new, uh, the biker angle in the mornings and stuff like that. They're loving that because a lot of guys don't want to go and read. They want to listen to it on the radio and stuff, but they don't understand the concept. This is something that is real new to a lot of people and I guess a lot of the supporters of these support clubs because they can't understand well wait a second they're letting people know what's up well that's because a lot of the other creators out there are chicken shit let's just put it out there they're chicken shit you know there's one or two that actually talk about what's going on in the motorcycle scene and the motorcycle club scene the uh, insane threat well motorcycle madhouse is unfiltered nobody filters us and the the clubs out there they don't tell us what uh, that don't happen on this show everybody should know that by now uh but there's it, it's just a foreign concept to them that there's an actual show out there that lets the people know what's going on now you can either have the mainstream media tell you what's going on in the scene or you can have a middle of the road platform that's club friendly tell you what's going on in the scene you know you got to choose you know but that's what i say <laughs> so but with that don't forget biker angle every morning at 7 30 a.m a new episode monday through friday uh motorcycle madhouse is on like you are watching now mondays and saturdays mondays at 7 saturdays at 11 new motorcycle madhouse radio which is on spotify itunes and all that good stuff a new episode at nine o'clock in the morning. Hey, Greg, I hope you enjoyed that new helmet for I am uh, ILM. You know, I think they're cool, that Bluetooth stuff. I actually had a sponsor, a potential sponsor, contact me about a HUD display thing. So I'm looking into that and an air conditioned helmet. Man, I'm getting all kinds of people. Once I open the door for sponsors, now they're like flooding in on me. So, but uh, anyway, Freddy, again, I just got it. I haven't read it uh, or any of that stuff. Actually, guys, if you want to uh, send Freddy uh, a note or help him with commissary, it's Ferdinand Angelo, New Jersey State Prison, 119-4398-849-805C, 2 Right West, cell 225, P.O. Box 861, Treadon, New Jersey. And that is 08625. And I'll actually uh, put that uh, address out in the uh, link description box of uh, the show and all that good stuff. But with that, I hope you guys are enjoying some writing time. 
And uh, you guys be careful out there, man. Watch the cager cagers and watch these people on their cell phones and stuff. Be safe, guys. Be safe. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We appreciate all your support. We'll see you next time.